he saying to join this webinar thing? I'm tasked to talk about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Basically, how to manage this, how to diagnose, and when to suspect and think about your patient with COPD. Oh, COPD is defined as a common and pre preventable and treatable COPD is defined as a common preventable and treatable disease is characterized by a persistent airflow limitation that's usually progressive and associated with an enhanced chronic inflammatory response in the airways and lung to noxious particles or gases. And exacerbations and comorbidities contribute to the overall severity in individual patients. I'll be using the word gold here. And gold really is the Global Initiative for Chronic Obstructive Lung Disease. This was actually established back in 1998. It's a collaboration between the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute in the United States, the NIH in the United States, and the World Health Organization to focus on COPD. The first report of gold was done in 2001, and since then, yearly updates have been made. Comprehensive updates were done in 2006 and 2010, and the latest update was just done this year. When we think about COPD, it's a big global health problem. It is right now the fourth leading cause of death worldwide and by the year 2020 it is estimated to become the third leading cause for death and prevalence study in a study published in 07 showed that about 10 percent of the population would have airflow limitation which would be characterized as whether as moderate to severe COPD and this was done in multiple international sites and in the United States the death rate from COPD has increased over the last 30 years by over 100 percent 100 to counting mostly for the cause of the increase how about here in the Philippines what's the state of COPD as of present it is the fourth leading cause of death in the Philippines. And in the same bold study, which was published in 2007, bold released the burden of obstructive lung disease. It is about 14 in Manila would have COPD. There was a study which was published in 2011, by, done by several pulmonologists, one of whom was Dr. Roa, who's part of our reactor in this session. And it's about 20% in two rural areas in Nueva Ecija, two towns in Nueva Ecija. And unfortunately, only about 2% of these cases are diagnosed by doctors, and not only that, even once diagnosis is made, there's a high prevalence of under-treatment of the disease. And the most common cause of COPD in the country is still cigarette smoking. Unfortunately, the smoking rate in the Philippines right now, prevalence is about 28%, and this is still on the rise, unlike those in first world countries, first world countries which now the prevalence rate of smoking has dropped to less than 20%. In fact, in the United States right now, it is at its all-time low of 16%, whereas here in the Philippines, we're up to 28%. And the prevalence of secondhand smoking exposure, including that that we get from riding the bus or the trains, is up to 55%. Use of firewood for cooking, charcoal, farming, where we usually burn the crops after harvest, and a history of TB have been associated with COPD in the Philippines. The question is, why do we treat COPD? What is it? Why is it that something that has to be diagnosed and treated? Because COPD increase among those with severe COPD, PD, up to 40% would have died in three years, and unfortunately, the burden, burden of comorbidities would actually make this a huge problem for the community and the country, not only for the person itself. COPD caused by environmental tobacco smoke is a huge problem, 
And when you talk about environmental tobacco smoke, it refers to exposure from tobacco smoke from someone else's cigarette. So it is really the material in the indoor air that originates from tobacco smoke. And the higher the exposure to, in, to their secondhand smoking, we commonly know it, it's associated with a greater risk of developing COPD. And in fact, women married to smokers who smoke more than one pack a day has a 2.5 times greater risk for developing COPD. So what is the key risk factor for the development of COPD? Well, it's the cumulative exposure to noxious particles, the constant exposure for it. The most common would be cigarette smoking. You could have secondhand smoking, otherwise known as ETS environmental tobacco smoke, occupational dust and chemicals, and indoor air pollution, basically the use of fuel like uh, fire, charcoal, uh, fire, firewood and charcoal, which is really unfortunately a very common problem in third world countries. So what are we talking about when we talk about biomass fuel? Worldwide, among, especially among third world countries, we have a very high use of wood, charcoal, vegetable matter and animal dung. And about 50% of COPD deaths in developing countries are really from biomass smoke. And these are really mostly women who do the cooking. And this exposure is, has an increased association with the development of chronic respiratory tract infection as well as COPD. And the most polluting really are dried animal dung and scavenged twigs because these are cheap, very inefficient, and most highly polluting. Do you diagnose COPD? Well, the key indicator to consider is number one, these patients, dyspnea or worsening shortness of breath over time and with exercise is the most complicated with chronic product. Then you will get a history of exposure to risk. Most of these patients smoke. They use biomass for cooking or heating, or they have exposure to dust and chemicals. And we cannot negate that there must be some predisposition to COPD because there's family history of COPD. When you have the symptoms, the history, you need a spirometer to diagnose COPD. And COPD is defined as a post bronchodilator FEV1 over FEV ratio of less than 70%, which means that there is persistent airflow limitation. And we're going to go through again what we mean when we talk about an FEV1 over FVC ratio of less than 70%. As again, let me emphasize to make a diagnosis of CPOPD, aside from the symptoms and the history, a spirometry is required. The most common problem we have to face is how to differentiate between COPD and asthma because they may actually have sort of the same history and same symptoms. When you talk about COPD, the onset is usually midlife, in your 40s, the symptoms are slowly progressive. There's almost always a smoking history or exposure to occupational stuff or indoor pollution. There's dyspnea almost always during exercise. And when you do a spirometry, it's an irreversible airflow limitation. On the other hand, asthma, the onset is usually early in life, childhood, teenager, under 20s. The symptoms vary from day to day. Symptoms usually may be more common during the night or early in the morning. There's other symptoms of atopy, allergy, allergies, rhinitis, eczema, otherwise known as skin asthma. There's a family history of asthma. And when you do a spirometry, there is a reversibility in the airflow limitation. The new thing now to recognize is that it's not really new. It's been described actually since 2007. Up a good number of patients with obstructive airways dysfunction is what we call the overlap syndrome. They have signs and symptoms both of asthma and COPD, and this is you the clinician will find it hard to distinguish whether it's really asthma or COPD, even based on current diagnostic tests 
and that's what we call now an asthma COPD overlap syndrome. In fact, a recent review article, which was just published in the New England Journal of Medicine, estimated that up to 15 to 45 of patients with obstructive airways dysfunction will have the overlap syndrome. And as you can see in this table, you have here a where you have patients with easy asthma. Easy asthma is your current typical asthma. Patients with easy COPD, the prototype COPD, and then the last two columns are your ACOS syndrome, wherein the first third column is ACOS stemming originally from asthma, and the fourth column is the overlap syndrome stemming initially from COPD. So if you look at this, those with typical asthma, otherwise known as easy to diagnose asthma, the age of onset is usually very young, under 20. There's the presence of atrophy, meaning algae. They usually never smoke, and the dyspnea is not consistent. It's recurrent. It can be sometimes in the morning, sometimes at night, but they have periods of being normal. This thing almost invariably can be heard, and when you do a pulmonary function test or spirometry, it is reversible. And then there is bronchial hyperresponsiveness, which means that they do very well with inhaled anti-inflammatories. Patients of the prototype COPD, on the other hand, these are the ones which are easy to diagnose. They're usually older. They have current. They're usually smokers. They have really no history of allergy, and they're usually heavy smokers. This nya is not intermittent. It's chronic. And usually, if they're not having an exacerbation, you don't really hear the wheezing. The reversibility in the airway is not there and there is no bronchial hyperresponsiveness. On the other hand, as asthma progresses, they can develop features similar to COPD, then they develop the overlap syndrome, and in this case, they now have a chronic shortness of breath with flares in between. The airway reversibility disappears, but there is still bronchial hyperresponsiveness. On the other hand, Patients with COPD can develop asthma-like features where they have flares, chronic with flares, they have wheezing, there is some bronchial hyperresponsiveness, and there is some reversibility in airway obstruction. And if you think about it, estimate of 50 to 45 percent of patients would have this. When we talk about COPD, we have to think of other things. Again, differential diagnosis of COPD. As I mentioned, asthma is the most common. Things to consider, especially patients with COPD, have a lot of comorbidities. Congestive heart failure is something you have to consider. And in congestive heart failure, you will see more of a restrictive lung. The volumes are small. You will actually will guide you. Bronchi ectasis are usually more associated with recurrent bacterial infection, and your X-ray and your CD scan will help that. CB has to be considered, and the rarer differentials would be obliterative bronchiolitis, which you see in younger patients, or pan bronchiolitis, which is usually associated with chronic sinusitis. Again, the most important thing, aside from the signs and symptoms of your patient, you need a spirometry to make a diagnosis. It is the most reproducible and objective measurement. On the other hand, questions is, can we use the PIC flow to diagnose? And the answer is, it cannot reliably diagnose, even though it's because sensitivity is high, specificity is actually low, and COPD diagnosis is made when the post bronchodilator ratio is less than 70%, meaning the patient cannot exhale totally what it inhales because of the obstructive dysfunction, and that's COPD. Very important to emphasize, we do not advise screaming spirometry. Spirometry is only done in symptomatic patients. It is not like a mammogram that you screen. You do not do a spirometry if the patient is not symptomatic. And this is your classic spirometry finding in a patient who is normal and the patient who has COPD. As you can see, this is your inspiratory loop, and this is your expiratory loop. And in a normal patient, the expiration is smooth. 
You can see the smooth line. In patients with COPD, because of the obstructive airways, there's a scooping in the expiratory limb because the flow goes down as the volume in the lung decreases. And this is the numbers you're interested in. FEV1 is the amount of in liters the patient can exhale as a gas of how much she can forcibly inhale and in normal patient about 80% of what's inhaled can be exhaled upon. However, in COPD, it's always less than 70%, meaning a lot of the air gets stuck in. As you can see again, there is that problem in exhalation. And what do you say? What is normal then? Well, in fact, there's already uh, uh, tables of what's normal, FEV1 and FEC, most of these are in Caucasian. And Dr. Rowan and company again back in 1987 published the normal standards for Filipinos, and you can actually easily download this in the web, which was published in 1987, was republished in 2013, and this is based on the age and height and the gender of the patient. There's an expected normal. FEV1 and FVC, and again, easily downloadable in the web. Now, when we talk about COPD, now we talk about spirometry and its classification. Again, gold, which is really the one leading us in taking care of patients with COPD, diagnosed by spirometry, the staging, we have a stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four. Basically, the most important thing to start with is that all the ratios of FEV1 over FVC is less than 70%. Once it's less than 70%, you now look at the amount of air that can be exhaled in a second, and in mild COPD, they're able to exhale 80% of the predicted. In patients with moderate disease, it's between 50 to 80. In patients with severe disease, it's less than 50, but more than 30%. And in patients with very severe COPD, it's less than 30% of predicted. Or if it's less than 50, but chronic respiratory failure, but that's considered severe COPD. Now, when you guide and you categorize patients with COPD, you put together the spirometry grade plus the symptom. And patients are graded as to group A, B, C, and D. Group A patients are those whose PFT is in the one or two less exacerbations and very little symptom. Group B patients, they're still in category one and two in their spirometry, but they have more symptoms. Group C patients, spirometry are the moderate and very severe a lot of exacerbations, but the symptoms are not standing out. And group D patients are in the very severe obstructive dysfunction and spirometry, lots of exacerbation, and very symptomatic. And when we talk about symptoms, we actually can use several scoring systems. The one that's easily used is the MRT DISNU scale. Basically, all of us can easily remember this. Grade zero is basically no symptom. Grade one, breathless only on vigorous exertion, and two, three, four, five as the symptoms worsen. Anything grade two or higher is considered significant symptoms. So other tests to consider when you're diagnosing COPD, check X-ray on CT scan because you have to rule out other pulmonary comorbidities. Basically, lung cancer is a concern because patients with COPD have also high risk for lung cancer because basically they share the same risk factor, which is smoking. And we believe the presence of COPD may not actually help us remove some of the carcinogens that we actually inhale. We can also include, which is done in a more complete PFT or diffusion capacity. We have to consider doing oximetry and arterial blood gas. If your FDV1 is less than 35, so anybody with a more severe to very severe category in the spirology, exercise testing can be considered, although we usually don't usually do this. And very important to test for other comorbidities, coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, and osteoporosis. In patients with gold category 1, 2, 3, and 4, 
three-year mortality increase and if the more severe that spirometry is. So in the gold core category, very severe, up to 25% will not be around after three years. When you have now diagnosed your patient with COPD, what are your goals for you? Well, reducing the symptoms, which means relieve the symptoms, improve the exercise tolerance of this patient, and improve the overall health status, and reduce the risk for mortality and worsening of life, which means this prevent disease progression. Very important, treat and prevent exacerbations, and again, reduction of mortality. Now we go to pharmacological therapy for COPD. As I mentioned before, you categorize your patient to A, B, C, and D. Group A are low risk patients, CFD, and FEV1 of less than 80%, but fewer symptoms. The current recommendation is to consider active muscarinic antagonist or short acting beta agonist. So no maintenance meds. This is the recommendation first slide. And we will talk about about maybe the difference now on approaching patients with this. These patients were in low risk but more symptomatic, they would now need a daily maintenance long acting bronchodilator, whether you're going to consider LAMA, word LAMA. These are your long-acting muscarinic antagonists. When we're talking about LABA, long-acting beta agonists. So low risk, more symptoms, once a day, LAMA or LABA. In your patients who have higher risk, meaning FEV1, less than 50 but greater than 30, with fewer symptoms, you can consider combination inhaled corticosteroid with LABA or LAMA or now a combination of LAMA and LABA. And your patients with high risk patients, this is when the triple therapy may be considered. When we say triple therapy, LAMA, LABA, and inhaled corticosteroid. However, in the current code 2015, idea of maybe going into an alternative choice with better control is going into play. So even in group one patients, consideration now of starting them on a once a day bronchodilator is being considered, which means LAMA or LABA, and then your rescue with a short acting bronchodilators. Other possible treatment would be theophylline, but this is now going to, in your group B patient, a once a day bronchodilator, and your alternative choice now may be more of a combination of your LAMA and LABA, and then alternative therapy would be your as needed short-acting beta agonist or anticholinergics. In your more severe patients with less symptoms, your option is again a combination of LAMA or LABA or ICS with LABA, or you now can consider adding one a phosphodiesterase score inhibitor. And again, short acting beta agonists or anticholinergics. And in the most severe category, this is when you have a combination of LAMA or LABA plus in, uh, inhaled corticosteroid plus your phosphodiesterase inhibitor. And you can consider adding on acetylcysteine, theophylline, and again, short acting beta agonists. Okay, this sounds like complicated, but it's actually not. It's actually pretty simple. We have to think about the thing with COPD is we're flooded in the market with so many things. What do I use? What's the first line to do once I have diagnosed? Because anyway, in the market now, as you can see, you have a lot of short acting anticholinergics. You have the combination beta agonists and anticholinergics and the combination of long acting beta agonists plus steroid. And again, the ages for combination lama lama are now coming out into the market. So as you can see, you now are this array of options and the question is, what will I use for my patient? Which one? Remember that the beta agonists and the muscarinic antagonists work in different areas agents really work more in the proximal airways and your beta agonists work more in the peripheral airways.
And basically, both of them will produce bronchodilatation in different pathways. So the question is, which one should I use? Let's just start with your rescue medicine, the short acting inhalers. Which one should I use if I need something emergently? If you look into this data, which was published back in 1999, always aptly reversed with either salbutamol, butyrol, or in the most recent medication. So most of it's fine. So any of this will be good. And the question is, which one should I use? Long-acting muscarinic antagonist or the long-acting beta agonist? What are the adverse side effects of your lava? Will come and drop the rest of the mouth and some bit taste. If you have a question, which one will cause an increase in your uh, FEV1? There's really no difference between your life and your lava. So there is really no difference in the FEV1 improvement between lama and lava. So when do you consider you have decided you will use either your lama or your lava? Maybe considerations to think about if your patient is your patient will be a better option than lava. Okay? Get your red measurement to show you given acting the combination gave the high improvement the FP1 patient as a result. And again, the question is where is this improvement? It is the combination LAMA or LABA or the combination of inhaled steroid plus LABA. And as you can see in patients with COPD, we're not talking about asthma, the increase in FEV1 was highest in the LABA against the LABA ICF. And no brainer because two bronchodilators will be better than one. They work. Okay, the different theory. Effective in present database review in 2012 and all of these favor again using import compare for time of first equation CS the lama
sort of inhaling. This is what's steroid, the higher the for pneumonia. Lama or this step up if more symptoms, important to be very clean in the country. You have to advise strongly in a patient with a very strong nurse. Seat and counsel your patient. About vaccines, this is for your patients. CD, be known to reduce exacerbation both of COVID vaccines, influenza, and influenza vaccines from mortality advantage against or without vaccination. For pulmonary CD, very important. This exacerbation, this unplanned. When you put these patients on pulmonary rehab, and it benefits not only the severe category, even the mild to moderate will benefit. It reduces symptoms, very common with the because other message improves their quality of life. This can be provided with an outpatient therapy to consider one of the patients. Severe gore is saturated with number. Then you The boost car All your reduction at these the overlap treat more like than I actually swallow the sleep instead of putting it in the inhalers so you have to make sure your patient is 
there in can enroll in home rehab program please do so walking and breathing physical activity okay, nice. put in a capsule everything we know about COPD and as far as the biomass thank you for emphasizing okay. it get that for next okay. Yeah, I'm halfway around the world. Um. Oh. Okay. Uh. Can you As, as a cause of COPD, uh, when we made a survey in Nueva Ecija, and since people were also smoking, the rate of COPD was even higher than in Metro Manila. So a lot of effort should be done to reduce biomass exposure. Also, there is this uh, association of COPD and TB, whether this is just a recall bias or a real thing, I think it has to be studied and all the countries, maybe the Philippines is poised to do more of such studies, proving or disproving the relationship of COPD and tuberculosis. The problem of overlap syndrome you mentioned is really sometimes very difficult and the recommendation is for the is for the doctor to refer to a specialist to the pulmonary specialist because uh, we do have uh, important therapeutic considerations when there is just COPD when there is just asthma or where there is a real overlap as you very well mentioned also related to this is uh, that Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes we can. Yeah. Good. Okay, okay. So, uh, related to that last issue is that the health steroids with pure COPD may actually bring some harm to the occurrence of pneumonia. And that's why, as you mentioned, we do have choices that will be optimal for the patient and we don't have to use corticosteroids all the time. And then uh, the last thing I'd like to uh, uh, give some word is the uh, one you also emphasized that those who are prescribing inhalers are really duty bound professionally, morally, to also teach their patient how to use their, their inhalers. Because if the inhaler is not used properly, then, you know, patients don't get well, they just spend money and, and that's something really that has to be done in all clinic visits, whether it's their end time to consult, I inhaler you use, uh, really, before actually going up the ladder and giving more medication. I guess uh, that's it. Uh, uh, those who require oxygen, by the way, now we have very inexpensive, I'd say cheap, uh, pulse oximeters from China and I use them a lot now you just have to test that the product is functioning and if they are functioning then they, they can be as reliable as the US made uh, pulse oximeter anyway this is US made uh, copied by China uh, okay that's all for the moment uh, I hope you got all that okay. um, any more other uh, Reaction, Dr. Roa? 
since uh, Yvonne uh, prompted me, you mentioned vaccination, it should really, it should really, really do. Now, for pneumonia, there is uh, this uh, advocacy now to give, for example, the pneumococcal vaccine uh, just before the patient goes home, so that they will not forget to have, and it has been found that those who consult will get admitted for pneumonia actually had a prior admission and they forgot, forgot all about the vaccine. Now, can we do that in a COPD who is uh, recovering from an exacerbation since these patients are still loaded with the oral steroids? But I, I, I wouldn't really know the answer to that. Personally, I thought, as again, if you guys are still on steroids, you send them all steroids and steroids, you will assume that their immune system is not robust yet to give an immune system response. So I usually tend to give it one month after discharge, whether back to their stable state. Because these patients are usually your chronic patients who follow up with you, and I don't have a problem with them following it up and giving it as an outpatient. But me personally, I don't do it just before discharge because these are patients are still loaded up with a lot of students. Oh. Thank you. I guess with regards to pneumococcal vaccine, I'd like to ask Dr. Damien Grass and Dr. Roa. There's these two preparations. Which one did you give? Dr. Roa, what's your take on that? Uh, Dr. Dr. Roa, what's your take on that? Which one well, do you uh, give? The Pneumo 23, the Prevran 13, or both? Or you follow the recommendation which to give both? Yes, of course it could be both, but I usually start with the uh, Prevran, the conjugated vaccine. And the recommendation yeah. now of the expert committee in the U.S. is to give the second one a year after. Uh, almost yeah. the same as the other way around. Whereas before, we, the, the move was to give the, the polysaccharide vaccine after two months, but, but they have simplified it to just one year at a time, starting with, uh, I would start with the Art. conjugate with the webinar. I'd like to ask both, uh, would be, what are the most common, um, when you're teaching the patient to use your inhaler, what are the most common that you know? Ah, depends on which device you're using. The meter dose inhaler is sometimes, number one, they cannot coordinate. And unfortunately, the older your patient, the harder it is for them. That's now you have now the powder devices, the crushable devices. In patients with very low inspiratory flow rate, meaning they cannot inhale, that's when unfortunately you have to consider using a nebulizer. But again, um, the coordination, whether they're clicking it properly, whether they're inhaling properly, whether they're holding their breath. Uh, you can actually look, you as a clinician can actually look at YouTube how to properly use this so that you can make sure your patients are using this. Dr. Roma, what are your other thoughts on making sure they're using their inhalers properly? I also look at the YouTube and show it to the patient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, YouTube. for the <laughs> eyes, uh, we also have these valve spacers that uh, yeah. are, you know, that, that cover the, for better deposition, you need a bigger one. So it's quite cumbersome, but we just have to uh, convince them that, uh, especially those that uh, we yeah. mentioned are yeah. quite having difficulty already uh, getting good inspiratory flows, they will be better served with uh, a valve spacer. And now we have uh, also a uh, softer mist inhaler, uh, I will mention that, right. as well as fine particle inhalers that are what I call them a little bit more forgiving. But they still have to be checked all the time. Okay. 
from the audience for either Dr. Aroa or Dr. Uh, Ruth. From the audience? You can uh, send them in. Yeah. Maybe you can also email to us or text to us. And uh, uh, that, thank you very much for your, your uh, email. Ah, it's getting choppy. Anyway, after this session, an email containing a survey link will be sent to you. If you can answer the survey, so can we can assess and improve our webinar and address more of your preferences and give your material to this session. After answering this uh, survey, we will be giving out a certificate which will be sent to you. Again, uh, thank you for joining us. And we uh, will invite you to continuing monthly semi webinar series, uh, which will be uh, scheduled or will be uh, announced or posted at the most probably UTM LTCH slash UT Med webinar. Um, after this conference, um, we would like to also to invite you to attend the conference to be held on December 15. Okay. 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Registration is free and CME units will be given. We register again at uh, www.upmas.upcm.ca. Uh, um, again, we would like to uh, thank our sponsors, uh, AstraZeneca, CBCI, and Borringer Engelman. And with this, um, uh, and in behalf of Class 1990, the UP Medical Society, we will thank you uh, for this. Bye-bye. Thanks, sir.